Hello, vintage computer fans. Here is another demo of my gorgeous microprocessor MPF1 Plus or I Plus, but I think it's a Roman one here, right? So, following, I'm just calling it the Plus, and um, I'm going to demonstrate the basic, which is in this 8 kilobyte uh, EEPROM here. Um, this basic is really much more usable and practical than the tiny basic in the MPF 1B that I demonstrated in my other video. So this basic has floating point, it has uh, strings, it has alphanumeric input and output, it has arrays, it has uh, even uh, string processing functions, etc. Um, I also have the printer connected, right, for nice prints, printouts as before. And I'm also going to demonstrate cassette storage today with the tape recorder, so real classic um, vintage computing going on here. So, this is actually my second uh, microprocessor plus, right? Um, I got this fairly inexpensive on eBay, it was advertised as non-working and um, it turned out that this uh, multiplexer ship um, needed to be replaced. After I did that, the display was back and the machine was just working fine. So that was a really good um, buy and deal, and yeah, that's the nice thing about these old vintage machines, right? Um, it's all, you know, dip, um, through hole technology. You can easily fix it yourself if you have a logic probe and an oscilloscope and some basic soldering skills and um, know how to know a little bit about electronics, right? So far I, I haven't seen a machine which I wasn't able to fix. Um, so as a somewhat more interesting example than Hello World for our microprocessor basic programming exercise, I have selected the classic Sif of Erastos right, which of course was an ancient Greek and mathematician uh, 300 years uh, BC, right, something along these lines. And what it is, the Sif of Erastos is a, a method of computing prime numbers up to a given um, upper bound, right. And um, as a kid, you know, growing up in the 80s with the uh, home computers, right, implementing the first version of this after I heard about it in my math lecture, right, um, I was well aware of the basic algorithm, right, and let me first um, uh, show you the basic version of this that I did understand also as a 13-year-old kid, right, but I did not understand the optimization which is uh, required that um, makes it much more feasible and more performant, right? So, but the basic version goes like this. You have basically uh, an upper bound. You want to compute prime numbers up to, right, like 20. And then you need like a big array, like a Boolean array or an integer array. And the positions basically represent, of course, numbers. And what the SIF does is it filters out all natural numbers in this array, which are not uh, prime, right? And it does that uh, with the following method, right? So it starts at two, one is already crossed out, right? And we're going to cross out the numbers which are not prime. So the first prime, uh, the first candidate, first number we are considering is two and it's not marked. So we know it's a prime number, right? So two is a prime number. Now we are going to cross out all multiples of this prime number, of this prime factor, uh, which of course results in, you know, these numbers being crossed out. Okay, so then we advance our pointer to three and three is not crossed out yet, so it must be a prime number as well. So our next prime factor now we can is three and we can cross out all multiples of three. Six is already crossed out, now nine we can also cross out, right? Twelve is crossed out already, then fifteen and so on, right? Eighteen um, and twenty-one is already out of the range of the array. And then we advance our point and now we are at 4 and since 4 is already crossed out we know it's not a prime number so there is no need to consider its multiples because it's not a prime factor and we keep going we encounter 5 and know it's a prime number because it's not crossed out yet so we look at 10 15 20 and nothing new right and at that point it's of course um, already obvious that uh, we are done and that we have already computed all prime numbers up to 20, so it's 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19. But, um, you know, as a kid, implementing this algorithm, I would probably not have stopped at 3, but I would have kept going, you know, maybe until I uh, reached either all the numbers, you're right. I probably would have only considered the odd numbers. Um, 
but um, I certainly wouldn't have stopped at uh, at three. And actually, you do not need to consider um, prime numbers um, larger, uh, prime factors larger than three. And that's what I didn't understand as a kid. But um, now it's pretty clear to me. And uh, I just wanted to share this. Um, so why is that? Okay, so if x is not a prime number, right, then we can write x in the form p times r. And in such a way that p is the smallest prime factor in its uh, prime factorization, right? You remember that each number can be written in a unique way as a product of prime factors, right? And prime factors are, of course, prime numbers themselves. So, and we can, of course, order them. So, and so we can arrange it in such a way that P is the smallest prime factor, right? Or one of the smallest prime factors, right? Um, if there are, for example, four is two times two, so it's two times the prime factor two, right? But then it would be um, still the smallest in its prime factors would be P equals two and R would also be two, right? But in general, R does not need to be prime because it's just a product of two um, terms here, right? So we can assume though that P um, is smaller or equal to R, right? Because um, that's just the way we set it up, right? And um, so the equal case is demonstrated with four, P and R are the same, two uh, and two, right? But if you have something like 15, then it's three times five, then P would be three and R would be five. Or if you have 30, then it's 2 times 3 times 5. So P would be 2 and R would be 15, right? And um, for 49, we would have 7 by 7. P equals 7, so this is kind of analog to um, 4, right? Where P and R are, first of all, prime factors and they are equal as well. So that's how that goes. So P is um, less or equal than R. R is either prime or not, and also R is greater than 1, right? Because if R would be 1, then X would be P, and P is a prime factor, then X would be prime. But here we are assuming um, we want to prove that it is divisible by P, which is the smallest prime factor, so it's not, so X is not prime, and um, so R is greater than 1. So, and the claim is that um, we find, you know, um, that P can be, um, is always, less or equal than the square root of x, right? And that's uh, easy to prove if you um, do a proof by contradiction. So if you assume that p is greater than square root of x, then that leads to a contradiction, right? First of all, I mean, if you um, rearrange the inequality, if p is greater than square root of x, then square root of x is smaller than p, right? That's obvious. Still, we want to write x in the form p equals r. Now, since we assume that p is greater than square root of x. That means that p times r is greater than square root of x times r, right? Now it's obvious uh, we still want to reach x with that product here, but to reach x, it's clear that um, r must then be smaller than um, the square root of x, right? But that obviously then um, produces a contradiction now because we assumed that p was um, greater than square root of x. And um, we also just said that r must be smaller than square root of x. However, that then means that um, p is greater than r, right? If you look at this. And if p is greater than r, then this assumes, this contradicts our initial, um, you know, setup, basically, that we said, okay, p is smaller or equal to r. So what you see is at that point, you know, um, you p and r basically flip around, right? So um, so this is how that optimization works. So we are going through the uh, CIF. We are starting um, with a for loop at 2. And then we are checking in the array if, uh, you know, the current um, number in the array is already crossed out. Then we ignore it. Otherwise, you know, it's uh, a prime factor. Then we are going... Um, through the multiples of this number and cross out all its multiples, right, as we did, and um, until we reach the end of the array. And then we continue our pointer to the next um, prime factor that we encounter, right? And if we are above the square root of, um, 
of our um, upper bound, right? Square root of n or square root of x here, right? In this case 20, then we just stop and then we are done. And then we just print out all the numbers in the array which um, are not crossed out and those are our prime numbers. So yeah, so this is how that works, right? Just a little reminder and um, so let's uh, implement this now. So let's fire up the basic now. Ctrl B is for cold start, right? And we can also warm start the basic with Ctrl C. It asks for the start address of the basic RAM. And the machine has eight kilobytes of RAM here from F000 to FFFF. And the default is F000, right? So um, the printer is turned off for now. Um, it can be turned on either from the monitor using Ctrl P or from basic um, using this call, right? which is a software switch, you can turn it on and off and then everything you um, print, so here's a print statement, right, for example, pi gets uh, printed to the to the printer, right, there it is, uh, but for now let's just turn off the printer again, call 405 and then we see um, everything on the display, right, so let's print pi on the display, there we go and then the machine, you know, has, um, for example, trick functions, right? And um, things like square root, right? What's the square root of 9? Yeah, very useful machine. So um, let's start by um, putting in a version of the SIF of Aristosthenes. And um, so I'm just inputting the program now. So we want to compute all prime numbers up to n, right? So input n. Then um, the SIF requires a big array, uh, which is being used to cross out the multiples of um, prime numbers that are known to be prime by now. So, and then <coughs> we are enumerating basically um, all uh, prime factors right from um, 2 to the square root of the number that we are going to test which is a common optimization for the SIF right so now here's the test if um, we already know <coughs> that this is not a prime number, so then we have a 1 in the array there. It starts with all being zeros, right? So we already excluded this. Then we don't need to test um, and cross out further um, multiples of i. And we go to 100. Else we um, increment, we initialize our um, the variable here, which will be used for crossing out now um, the multiple of the current prime number which is an i starting from i square basically this compensates for the fact that uh, we are only considering prime factors up to the square root of n and now at that point we know you know we have a prime number at hand so and we are crossing out its multiples and then we are going to the next multiple of that prime number until we have considered all uh, multiples of the current prime number and then we are ready to check for the next prime factor and until we reach you know the square root of n so now at that point we have all our um, prime numbers in the array and we only need to print them out to the screen right so if um, <clears throat> the number was marked as being prime so basically it's not crossed out right so there's no one in the array then we are going to print it on the display and then you know we do that for all our array positions from 2 to n so good to go so let's maybe check that with 21st And that looked good, right? So, how about 50?
yeah, the machine is actually not too slow. Maybe let's get a... Now it's time to get a nice print out. Turning on the printer again. And we can just list the program on the printer now. Alright, so how fast is this machine, right? And um, how long does it need in order to compute um, 50 numbers, um, so, or prime numbers up to 50, I mean? And um, let's, you know, just time it <clears throat> and let's see. So I'm turning off the printer again. And maybe let's actually compute all prime numbers up to 100 and start. As soon as it starts printing on the display, I hit stop. Okay, about um, 11 seconds, I was a second late or so. It's actually uh, a trick. Um, which allows you to make it faster. So similar to the um, ZX81, most of the time of the machine, the processing time is spent for scanning the keyboard for input as well as for driving the display, even if, if there's nothing to display. It spends time, you know, scanning through the display buffer and displaying nothing, basically. So, and there is a command, a statement, which allows you to turn off keyboard scanning and um, the display. Um, similar to uh, fast and slow in the ZX81. So with S on, uh, that means actually um, speed on, right? So that's the fast mode, right? And then when we are going to print it, uh, the numbers at line 110, I think, this is where the loop starts, right? Then we need to turn it off again. The fast mode so that we can print. So I'm entering at 105 fast off or speed off and um, let's see what kind of difference that makes in terms of performance. So we had about 11-12 seconds previously and now let's see how fast it is. Yeah, only six seconds, right? So, makes quite a difference. All right, now that our program is working nicely, we want to save it to tape. But before we do this, it's important to disable the keypad um, beeps, because otherwise you turn on the tape recorder and you're recording the beeps uh, to tape as well. And that might make it difficult to, um, you know, restore the program later from tape because there is no motor control right so you type save and while you're saving um, and typing it and the recorder is already running you get all the beeps to tape and that is what we want to avoid so now I can just start the recorder and I can um, type save here and um, so the program needs to have a fire name it's a four letter um, word right so good that there's no shortage of four-letter words in the English language. And um, it's important that you have a proper file name, so it cannot start with, uh, you know, a non-alphanumeric character, so like um, even a space or a um, or double quotes or so. The machine is not able to read it back otherwise, so... Okay, let's stop the tape recorder, rewind, and now let's try to load it back. Hit the reset button, and um, so the program uh, will still be there. So if I, even if I pull the plug, um, the machine is still powered by the printer, right? The printer has its own power supply, and 
So that's enough to um, actually keep the RAM um, supplied, um, right? And um, even though I don't have the battery backed up um, RAM currently, so there are no backup batteries installed for the RAM, but still if I go and uh, do a warm start of the basic using Ctrl C, you see that our program is still there simply because it was powered by the printer. So in order to get rid of the program from memory, I'm just invoking the cold start again. Uh, control B, right, and that um, clears the memory. So now this time the uh, program is gone. I can now also um, turn on back again the uh, key beeps because I kind of like the audible um, feedback, right? And um, let's try to load it back. And also here, I think you have to supply the file name because otherwise it won't load it back properly. So hitting play on the recorder. Well, let's see if we can <clears throat> read it back. So there's some static already coming. So it's also echoed in the loudspeaker here. This should display the fire name, right? And um, if it matches the fire name um, you enter it, it'll load the program, otherwise it won't. So then it will just go through the tape until it finds the file with a matching fire name right on tape. So hopefully the uh, audio levels are right. Let's have our fingers crossed. Oh god, so the fire name is already correct. And now it should be loading it actually. Fingers crossed. Ha! Huh. Success! And does it work? Oh, yeah, it does. All right, wonderful. Maybe one more printout. Call 405, printer control, enable the printer. How about 600? Yeah, now it's working. Let's see how long it takes. Already about five seconds, so let's add just you know five seconds to this. Let's see how long it takes. So it's about you know forty five seconds, I would say. Not too bad. How does the microprocessor and its basic compare to something like the ZX81, which is also not really a powerhouse in terms of compute power, right? So both machines have a, a Z80 a CPU, but um, the ZX81 has the A version and it's running at uh, 4 MHz. But then also the machine is uh, really slow um, when it comes to um, text output on the screen because it has no dedicated video hardware really. Or the CPU has to generate the video signal and basically 80% of the time is spent on uh, producing the video signal. 
So um, I have the same program here um, as on the microprocessor and um, I'm also using the fast mode for the prime number computation. So let's see um, how fast um, it can compute the numbers. Remember on the microprocessor if we turned off um, display and keyboard it took about six seconds. So let's start this program on the ZX ZX81 and again we are using 100 and go. All right, that was really fast, so it takes about, you know, not even two seconds for it to compute um, these numbers in memory with video turned off, so in the fast mode, right? And um, so it compares this to the six seconds in the microprocessor, so it's a bit slower, even with, um, of course, the CPU is twice as fast, so, so it's uh, really four seconds compared to six seconds, but I, I must say not too bad for the microprocessor. And uh, you can tell how slowly, um, how slow the Z ZX81 gets when it starts printing the numbers on the screen, right? So um, how about we um, disable basically the fast mode by just removing that line, 15. So now video is not being, is not turned off while it's computing. So it's spending a lot of time basically um, for updating the video. Let's run that again and see how long it takes now. And again, I'm using the stopwatch here. So we had about two seconds with in the fast mode, right? And now, um, let's see. Video stays on, is not being turned off, and it's computing. Okay, so it's about 10 seconds, right? And yeah, so if the video stays on, then it um, is really in the range of the uh, microprocessor, right? I mean, it's still two seconds uh, faster, right? The microprocessor needed 12 seconds with, um, um, with video and keyboard scanning enabled, right? But um, yeah, the microprocessor is really not too bad in terms of performance, I would say. So let's have another look at the program here and give you a closer view by zooming in a bit. All right, guys, that's it for today. Thanks for watching.